Hi, welcome to the webinar entitled, It's Never Too Late, Top Ways to Protect Your Assets from Nursing Home Costs. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to give you some insights into what is called crisis Medicaid planning. That is planning at the time a person is entering a nursing home. Uh, my name is Matt Parker. I am a certified elder law attorney and one of the principals at Marshall, Parker & Weber. Co-presenting with me today is one of the firm's longtime staff members, Patty Jo Turner. Uh, she has been a case manager for over 20 years. Now, the presentation is going to last about 30 minutes, uh, and don't hesitate to ask a question as we present. We will try to get to your questions as time permits. Now, let's get right into the fact pattern so we know what type of case is considered crisis nursing home planning. Here we have Rick and Thelma. Uh, they are a married couple. Uh, Rick has advanced dementia. He has significant memory issues and is prone to wandering. Um, he has uh, the uh, inability to put his clothes on without assistance. He cannot remember to take his medications. And he will not eat without the assistance of others, and he needs help with personal hygiene. Now, they have a modest house, about $100,000 in the bank in CD, savings, and a checking account. Thelma has an IRA of about $25,000, and they have two cars. Rick has a truck, and Thelma has her Subaru. Thelma and Rick both have Social Security income, each at about $1,500 per month. Now, Thelma can no longer take care of Rick at home. Uh, she has decided to place him in the nursing home in the following week. The nursing home is charging $10,000 per month. She and her daughter, Linda, come to me uh, for advice as to how to financially protect Thelma when she places Rick in a nursing home. So those are the facts of our case. We've got somebody who is entering a nursing home, a family who is concerned about losing what they have for the cost of care, and they are interested in knowing what they can do now. First of all, I have to tell you what the options are to pay for long-term care. So there are three sources of payment. Uh, you have to understand that there is no government benefit that automatically pays for long-term care, uh, whether you are at home or in a nursing home. You essentially have three choices when it comes to paying for your care. One, you can simply pay privately. So if you have enough resources to pay the cost of care, that would be option one. Number two, you could have acquired a private insurance called long-term care insurance. Now, you need to do this uh, when you are healthy and you're able to medically qualify for the insurance, so this is not a crisis option. So third is what most individuals end up doing is they take steps to accelerate their eligibility for a government program called Medicaid, uh, which is also known as medical assistance here in Pennsylvania. So we will be using both terms in the presentation. Let's presume Rick and Thelma do not have long-term care insurance. So they're going to need to qualify for Medicaid. Now, I want to just have a quick comment about Medicare and why it does not pay for long-term care. Uh, Medicare is a form of health insurance issued by the federal government. It covers skilled care, such as that you would receive in a hospital or the care provided by a doctor. There is very limited Medicare coverage for nursing home care, uh, and it has to be associated with skilled care. The care provided by a doctor or a nurse, typically while you're getting rehab in a nursing home is a classic scenario. And the time that Medicare covers is limited to 100 days per spell after, after you have stayed in a hospital as an inpatient for three days. So typically somebody is injured, maybe they've fallen, they went to the hospital, they stayed there as an inpatient for a few days and then were transferred to the nursing home for rehab. And Patty Joe, this is where I'll have you chime in. Uh, do, do our clients normally get the full 100 days? Unfortunately, no, they don't. Um, those Medicare days often come to an end before the 100 day total has expired. The reason for discontinuing Medicare is usually due to the fact that the patient isn't benefiting from the therapy or other skilled services any longer. And although the Medicare coverage rules permit payment for those services, if they are needed to, quote, maintain the patient's current condition or prevent or slow further deterioration. That standard isn't always applied. So when Medicare is being discontinued, there's a three-day advance notice. 
that letter will offer the option to appeal, and we recommend that an appeal be requested. Your determination on the appeal is issued within 24 hours. And although there's no guarantees, we have seen some clients receive additional therapy and additional days of Medicare coverage. All right. So that, that's why Medicare doesn't come up for long-term stays. So in this scenario, it's the Medicaid program that Rick will need to apply for to cover the cost of his care. Now, Patty, Joe, I'm going to ask you some questions about some of the issues that come up in qualifying uh, someone for Medicaid. First of all, it's the medical criteria that's at issue before we get into the finances. At what point does somebody meet the criteria for qualifying for the Medicaid program if they want this care in a nursing facility? All right. Well, to be eligible for medical assistance under that nursing home care level, then the applicant must need that type of care that would be provided there. They need to require assist assistance with three of the six activities of daily living, and sometimes you'll hear them referred to as ADL. The ADLs include bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, ambulation, and eating. Uh, and additionally, there are other considerations made um, to deal with memory loss and safety concerns. So there's a medical evaluation that's a completed by the physician, and then a second one that's completed by the caseworker from the Area Agency on Aging. All right, so that's, that's good. That's the, the background with regards to the medical issues. And Medicaid has all of these financial uh, issues as well. So once you get through the medical criteria, then you jump into the asset evaluation. Now, for the person entering the nursing home, the amount of assets that a person can keep while they're on Medicaid is going to be very limited. Um, now, the theory is that if you're, the state of Pennsylvania is going to pay for your care in the nursing home, you shouldn't need a lot of assets in your name. Uh, the assets that are capped are known as the available assets. These are typically the liquid assets that you could cash in to pay for your care, such as CDs, uh, uh, stocks, investments, maybe bonds. Um, for the person entering the nursing home, the amount of these liquid assets that one can keep and qualify for Medicaid is typically limited to $2,400 up to a maximum of $8,000. And the folks with $8,000 typically have very low income. Now the qualification rules for Medicaid differ greatly from those who are married versus those single individuals. Now for the married individuals, there are spousal protections. That is, there are additional available assets that you can keep if there's a healthy spouse who might be living at home and is not ending up in the nursing home, so he or she's gonna live independently for some time. Now, the amount of resources this healthy person can keep will vary from case to case, but they're generally calculated by taking one half of the total available resources up to a maximum amount. So if they had $100,000, the resources that could be protected for the community spouse would be $50,000. Now, one of the key planning techniques that we're going to discuss is rendering some of these available assets unavailable so you don't have to spend them on your care and it's also easier to qualify for Medicaid. Now, there are also what we call unavailable or exempt assets when applying for Medicaid. The largest of them is the house. Uh, now, as we'll see in a minute, the house may in fact be made unavailable only during your lifetime. There's a program that occurs after your death that could affect your house. So, the other unavailable assets include one of your cars and your personal possessions, as well as your irrevocable burial counts for both a husband and a wife. Now, the gifting rules. Now, if there's a cap on these amount of assets that you can own and qualify for Medicaid, why not just give the assets away? Let's just turn them over to your kids. Well, if everybody could do that without consequence, the entire population would qualify for Medicaid. So the federal government set up some rules regarding your ability to qualify for Medicaid after you have made a gift of money or property. Here's how the rule operates. If you made a gift of assets, such as a cash, car, real estate, within the five years prior to applying for Medicaid, you will create a period of ineligibility for you and your spouse. Now, this five-year period is known as the look-back period. So if you gave one away an asset during the five years prior to applying, there will be a period of eligibility, ineligibility, when you are otherwise eligible for Medicaid. Therefore, it follows that if you're going to gift any assets away, it makes sense to do so well in advance, preferably 
prior to the five years before applying for Medicaid. Now, there are exceptions to the gifting rules. Uh, you can gift money, for example, to a disabled child, uh, that is, somebody who qualifies as a disabled person under the Social Security Disability Rules. So if Linda was receiving Social Security Disability, there'd be no transfer penalty for giving money to, or property to her. And also children who provide care to their parents in the parent's home for a period of two years prior to admission to the nursing home can receive a gift of the home uh, of the parents, provided they don't have another home to reside in. Uh, and now, if in order to qualify under this exception, a doctor does need to certify in writing that the child did provide the care for this exception to apply. Now, there's a program called estate recovery. Uh, essentially, the government keeps track of how much Medicaid they give you during your lifetime. At your death, if you happen to own your home, the state can put a lien on the house up to the amount of Medicaid provided to you to pay for the cost of your care. Now, this estate recovery program can be avoided so long as you don't have ownership of the home at the time of your death. Now, that is, if the deed doesn't reflect that you, the Medicaid recipient, was the owner upon your passing. So when you're planning to protect your assets uh, from Medicaid availability, you need to be concerned about the, how the home is titled. Anytime you'll have to take it out of the name of the person who's applying for Medicaid. Now, one of the first steps uh, with regards to the advice for Thelma is to, you know, what assets are available and what assets are exempt. Oftentimes, I'll go over the facts of a particular case and I'll make a list, uh, those that are exposed to pay for your care and those that are exempt. So here I'll bring Patty Jo in and let's go over some of the facts of this case. Uh, we, we have some available assets in this case. Well, I said there was $100,000 in the bank. Now, one of the questions we get all the time is, does it matter whose name is on these bank accounts, Thelma or Rick? No, it, it doesn't matter. Um, if a bank account is titled either jointly or individually in either name, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Because Thelma and Rick are married, those assets are considered marital assets, and then the entire account is going to be looked at as available. Yeah. So when you said, I do, you are a unit in the eyes of the government. I do, and I share. Yes and you share in each other's money. Now, uh, so one half of these assets are available uh, as a protected share for Thelma because her resource allowance is 50% of the overall amount, so $50,000. Now, are there a maximum and minimum CESRs they issue every year? Do you know what the numbers are this year in 2019? As of now, the minimum is $25,284, and the maximum, is $126,420. Yes, so if everybody's understanding here, if you had a million dollars, you could not keep a half million dollars and qualify for Medicaid. You cannot go over the maximum resource allowance. Right. So what other assets are protected as unavailable in this case? So if you are looking at the list of things that are not considered, they would include irrevocable burial accounts, one motor vehicle, your personal property, the residential property, and then the IRA that's owned by the well spouse or the one who is not going to be going into the nursing home. Ah, so Thelma's $25,000 IRA is exempt in this case, okay? Now, is it wise to leave the house in joint names? Rick and Thelma both own it. Now, what would you typically do in this case or be concerned about? Well, because the residence is considered an unavailable asset during the lifetime of the owner, you can own the home and still qualify for medical assistance. However, if the recipient of medical assistance is owning the property at the time they pass, then the Department of Human Services is going to have an automatic lien against the property up to the amount that medical assistance was paid for that person's care. So in this case, we would recommend a new deed to transfer the ownership of the residence to Thelma in her name alone. This can protect the property from the Medical Assistance Estate Recovery Program for the cost of Rick's care. Yes, and some people are listening going, oh, well, what about this five-year look-back period? Yeah, we're gonna move the house from uh, Rick to Thelma. Any problems with this? Fortunately, there are no penalties associated with transferring assets between spouses. The five-year look-back does not apply in this case. Good, good scenario. So when it comes to the vehicles, only one of them is exempt. What would you recommend doing with the second uh, vehicle? Probably uh, Rick's truck. <laughs> of course, it would be Rick's yes, truck. Yes, yes. 
So the most valuable motor vehicle is going to be the one that we consider exempt. Someone may decide to sell the truck, or she might decide to trade in both of the cars for a newer one. She can also have the second vehicle appraised and keep it. And then the value of that car would just be part of her protected share of the assets. Yeah, sometimes those old beat up trucks, they're only worth $1,000, so my clients often keep them. And then we're at the IRA. It's exempt because it's Thelma's. Um, anything you would recommend doing with the IRA? Yeah, the, the first thing we would look at would be to recommend Thelma change the beneficiary designation. It probably names her husband, and we would suggest that she change that beneficiary designation to her daughter, Linda, as the primary beneficiary. Consider, if Rick was named as the beneficiary and he received those proceeds, it would simply put him over the resource limit for his medical assistance benefits, and the, cost, the benefit from that IRA would be lost to the cost of his care. Okay. I thought that Rick and Thelma have modest income. Well, Rick's heading to the nursing home. What happens to his income uh, when he enters that nursing home? When Rick is approved for medical assistance, he's going to have a patient pay obligation to the nursing home. So he'll be able to keep enough of his income to pay for his supplemental insurance premium, his Medicare premium, and $45 a month for personal needs, you know, getting his hair done. Okay. And <laughs> yeah, they haven't changed that number in a long time. I'm wondering if, if Thelma needs that money to live on, can she keep some of Rick's income? Possibly. As part of the application process, Thelma's going to need to provide verification of her shelter expenses. That would be things like her water, her heat, her taxes, maybe an outstanding mortgage. So she is entitled to a certain amount of income to meet her needs based on those shelter expenses. Okay, so if she's got high expenses, they let her keep some more of the income. Uh, and I, I presume she can't keep just, you know, an enormous amount of money. Is there a maximum amount and, and a minimum amount that she's at least allowed to have? Because some spouses don't have a lot of money. There is. There's some guidelines. Yeah. So Selma's income is, we, as we've established, about $1,500 a month. Yeah. And she will be able to keep some of Rick's income to increase hers. Yeah. So the minimum amount of income that she might be able to have is $2,058 per month. So in order to reach that, she could keep an additional 558 from Rick's income. Now, if Selma had higher shelter costs, um, such as a mortgage, or if she's residing in an assisted living facility, she would be allowed to keep more of Rick's income to increase her monthly income up to a maximum of 3,160, dependent upon her shelter costs. You know, a lot of people might be listening to these numbers right now, and and if you're in 2019, these are the figures of 2019, and they, they change periodically. Uh, they go up, thankfully, um, and the uh, Department of Human Services does issue the new numbers every year. All right, so spending down is the next discussion. Rick can only keep $8,000 here. He's got $50,000 of his share. So how might he get that $50,000 spent down very quickly so he can become eligible for Medicaid? The um, burial account, um, the excess resources can be used for things to purchase that, um, that they might need. Um, this would include home improvements or repairs, payment of debts like credit cards or possibly that new car that we mentioned. Another way to preserve assets is to, pur is to purchase those irrevocable burial accounts, which are considered unavailable assets. There is a maximum amount of money that you can spend on a burial account and that amount is determined county by county. Irrevocable burial accounts are considered a retroactive expense. That allows the purchase of this account to reduce the excess resources going back to the admission date. And these irrevocable burial accounts are used quite a lot in, in our planning. Uh, typically what you do is you go to a funeral director, you set up the account uh, via a contract. Uh, you can do it directly with the bank, but there's occasionally some issues with those so we recommend going directly to the funeral home and uh, setting up a contract there for your burial arrangements. All right. So in some cases, uh, you know, clients already have some of these items purchased. They don't need a new car. Uh, the burial accounts, maybe all they want to do is cremation, so it's a lot less expensive, and they still have to spend down their money. Uh, and they have to do so quickly in order to become eligible for Medicaid. Otherwise, this nursing home bill is going to have to be paid every month. 
So here's how this works when it comes to acquiring a Medicaid annuity for Thelma. We would take the $50,000 in excess resources and acquire something called an immediate annuity for Thelma. An annuity is a type of investment that pays Thelma a very fixed monthly amount for a number of years. Now, by investing the $50,000 with an insurance company in this annuity, Thelma can convert the $50,000 that Medicaid rules define into uh, an annuity that Medicaid will then define as income for Thelma. And those income payments are hers to keep. She doesn't have to use them to pay for Rick's care. Now, the term of the annuity must be within Thelma's life expectancy. So uh, she can have money paid to her over five years at a rate of $10,000 per year plus interest, uh, but she can't stretch it out for a very long period of time. Now, there is a downside to this plan, and it's that Thelma must be alive to benefit from the annuity. If she does die, the Medicaid program has a claim against the money left in the annuity for any Medicaid benefits paid to Rick. So it's a really great benefit to protect additional assets for Thelma, and it can be done at the time Rick enters the nursing home. Uh, keep in mind that not all companies sell Medicaid annuities. Uh, there are some very strict terms to these annuities. Uh, you can only get the monthly payments over the term of the annuity. There's no cash surrender value. These contracts are irrevocable. So once you set them up, you're locked into the terms. Now, therefore, this is clearly a crisis planning technique. You would never do this ahead of time. That is, prior to somebody entering the nursing home, you do this at the time a person is entering the nursing home and you know how much you have in available resources that need to be spent down is only that amount that you invest in one of these annuities. Strongly recommend you work with an experienced elder law attorney when creating a Medicaid annuity. Now, unfortunately, the Medicaid application process for these uh, procedures um, that Rick and Thelma will be undertaking uh, can be very complicated. Um, you have a, a lot of resources in some of these cases. Some of you will have many, many more assets than, than Rick and Thelma have, and there's a lot of work to report all of this to the government and qualify someone for Medicaid. Now, Patty Joe, you've done your share of these applications, as have I. Tell me a little bit about the process that people will undergo. Of the application process for MA is a time-consuming process. At the time of the application, the caseworker assigned by the Department of Human Services is going to require the previous five years of financial records. This includes all bank statements, tax returns, and verification on all accounts that were opened or closed within the past five years. If the required documentation is not provided, then the application is going to be rejected. After you've got everything together and the application is filed, it can take up to 45 days for the application to be reviewed by the Department of Human Services. And I've seen many of our employees, yourself included, go through this process, and it's, it's a fact-finding mission. Uh, you know, many times it's a child trying to find the records of the parent. They don't know what the parent did with their money. They've got to gather bank records. And then, surprise, something shows up in the bank records that affects a person's eligibility. So. Uh, be attentive to this and, and, and understand that if something's going to happen to a loved one, you've got to get as many records as you can, as quickly as you can to your elder law attorney so they can properly process the application and get your loved one qualified for Medicaid. Otherwise, if it takes months to get just the information, you're going to be spending $10,000 a month on your care before Medicaid uh, is approved. Well, whenever we are planning or meeting with a client um, to qualify a loved one for Medicaid, the very document I go to review uh, first and foremost is the power of attorney. Now, this document allows your loved one to manage uh, a person's financial affairs. Um, many steps will have to be taken to qualify a person for Medicaid. It involves cashing out stocks, transferring ownership of life insurance, taking names off of deeds, or, or maybe changing beneficiaries. We really need a good power of attorney to do all of these acts in an effort to qualify someone for Medicaid. Some powers of attorney are really simple. Uh, they simply allow a person to pay the bills and not much more. Elder law attorneys tend to want a very broadly worded power of attorney uh, with typically uh, with, with powers that will allow someone to transfer ownership of assets, that is give money away or property, remove names from stocks and annuities and IRAs, um, 
add names to bank accounts, change beneficiaries, liquidate assets. All of those things need to be in the power of attorney uh, if the elder law attorney is going to help someone qualify for Medicaid. So if Rick did not have a good power of attorney, Alma would have a very difficult time qualifying him for Medicaid. So if you're trying to be proactive, make an appointment to update your powers of attorney so when the time comes, your loved one can help you qualify for benefits and protect the money and your property from the cost of care. And lastly, we'll probably want to recommend to Thelma to update her will. Uh, if she's going to own the house, the car, the money in the bank, uh, we don't want her existing will to leave everything to Rick. It would simply undo the plan we implemented if she dies before him. So I would have a new will crafted that would essentially disinherit Rick. Uh, there are ways to leave some money to him in trust if we want to, uh, but generally you have to skip Rick and pass everything to Linda. Well, that concludes the webinar. I hope that gives you some insights into a crisis planning for someone who's entering the nursing home. I know there's a lot more to this planning that we didn't cover, such as some unique planning for a single person. Uh, so don't hesitate to call the law firm for a consultation to learn more about how crisis planning might apply in your case. Thank you.